are going to jump into nutrition, metabolism, and body temperature regulation. This is um, a lot of information that I'm trying to squeeze into about a half an hour lecture. There's only five questions on the next test on this material. They are fairly easy questions. So if there's something that you don't quite get or understand, don't panic. Just trying to give you a general introduction. This is really something that you'll get into more with microbiology. Um, and this is just sort of, like I said, just a general introduction. So don't panic if some of this doesn't make sense. Get your notebook out, write down questions. I'd be happy to go over it with you. Okay, I just want you to have a general working knowledge. Um, review that first question. We're going to skip over that. That's just sort of an introductory thing that I wanted you to do. Okay, energy. We all know energy, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So, brief little review. Okay, adenosine triphosphate. I'm not going to zoom it in because I'm just going to make this brief. Adenosine triphosphate. Is that big enough? ATP can turn into a DP. And this is a reversible equation. ATP, ADP. ATP is the high energy form. ADP is the low energy form. So if ATP gets rid of a phosphate, that phosphate will actually go to a structure and give its energy to that structure to make that structure work. Okay. Um, the protein channels that are running through cell membranes need to receive a phosphate in order to work. So ATP gets rid of a phosphate, gives it to the protein pump, it can work. Sodium potassium pump, ring a bell, I hope, sort of, kind of. Okay, gives it that energy to do its work. So when that ATP gives away a phosphate, it turns into ADP. In order to become a high energy molecule again, it needs another phosphate to turn back to ATP. And it's a reversible equation going back and forth. So our body uses this ATP as its microscopic energy. In order to get more ATP, we need macroscopic energy going into our body as glucose, okay? We ingest that as kilocalories. Kilocalories, the actual definition you could read right there, heat needed to raise one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. That's the actual scientific um, definition of it. So when you ingest the calories that you eat in your foodstuffs during the day, this is how they've determined how many kilocalories are in a substance. Well, there's more steps to it. <clears throat> but it's the heat needed to raise the energy of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. Okay? So we have carbs, lipids, and proteins. Those carbs, lipids, and proteins have certain calories or kilocalories in them. Those kilocalories go into our body to give us energy. It's broken down in different ways. Those substances that we ingest eventually get small enough to be put into our cells. When it gets into the cells, the cell's job is to create ATP. Okay, So kilocalories are the major nutrients that we ingest. ATP is the energy that's created in cells itself. Okay, Carbs, lipids, and proteins, really quickly. These um, pyramids are crazy. They keep changing. Um, so it's a different conversation. Carbs primarily are used for energy. We will take carbohydrates that we ingest. There are some carbohydrates such as fiber that we can't break down that actually are used to clean out our intestines. Okay, but The carbohydrates that we can break down, we will break them down and eventually turn into glucose. That glucose will go into our cells and go through a very specific three-step process to create ATP. Okay, so carbs, that's what those are used for. Lipids, lipids are used for multiple things. Okay, lipids are used in the cell membranes to create our sex hormones, okay? So lipids are gonna be used for um, fat storage. They're gonna be our second best source of energy, okay? So lipids are used for multiple things. We'll get into this, it's just a brief overview. Proteins are gonna create the structures of the body for the most part, enzymes as well some hormones, okay? So proteins will be important more for structural kind of things. Vitamins and minerals are gonna be very essential, okay? Vitamins and minerals are known as our micronutrients because if you think about your vitamin that you take daily, it's very small. Carbs, lipids, and proteins are our macronutrients. Those are large, okay? 
Those are the large foodstuffs that we ingest. Those are macronutrients. So we need both. They're both very important, and they both do very different things. Okay, so minerals and vitamins, I'm not going to get into specifics of what they do because there are many of them that do many things. Okay, carbohydrates, we've got monosaccharides, disaccharides. I think I'm going to zoom in for the next couple of slides because it's mostly words. Let's see here. Okay, I'll get the hang of this eventually. Okay, carbohydrates. We're going to have monosaccharides, which are basic sugars, mono meaning one. Okay, mono meaning one. Disaccharides meaning two. So if we take two glucose units and put them together, that is a disaccharide. That is more complex. Polysaccharides are going to be multiple chains of glucose linked together. Some examples are starch and cellulose. Okay, it's way more complex than this, but once again, it's just a general introduction. We break these saccharides down to glucose. That's our body's main goal because glucose is going to be the guy that we want to put into cells to create ATP. Okay? ATP will create energy for the blood to be distributed to the whole body. ATP creates energy for the brain. Very important. Our body will sacrifice glucose to other organs in order to save it for the brain. We'll also store glucose in the liver as glycogen. Glycogen is the stored form of glucose. We can also convert glucose into fat. We'll store it into the subcutaneous or below the tissue. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Subcutaneous tissues is fat. Approximately 125 grams per day of complex carbs are required. This complex carbs, okay, that is not white breads, that is not sugars. Okay, you should try to have complex carbs because they're harder to break down. If you ingest simple sugars such as sucrose, which is going to be glucose and fructose stuck together, don't worry about it, I'm just giving some examples. If you ingest those simple sugars, your body absorbs it really quickly, it spikes your blood sugar, you have energy for a little bit of time, and then you drop out because your body will release a ton of insulin then the blood senses the insulin, or the body senses the insulin in the blood and thinks, oh, we need more sugar for that insulin. And you get into that bad cycle, okay? So carbs are good as long as you keep it to complex carbs, which are more complex. They're harder to break down, so your body takes a longer period of time breaking down the glucose off of it and absorbing it, rather than absorbing a bunch of sugar all at once. Lipids, okay, dietary sources, there's neutral fats, there's saturated fat, there's unsaturated fats, and there's essential fatty acids. Okay, saturated fats are the bad fats. Saturated fats are going to be animal fats. They're really compressed together, so they're thick fats like lard. Your body ingests them, and the body will actually create inflammatory responses against them. Okay, so saturated fats you want to keep at a very, very low level. Unsaturated fats, such as monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat, are the good fats. They'll actually help to balance your body out and clear out bad fats from the system. Okay. Um, they don't deposit a lot of fats into the body. So, interesting enough, even though they are fats, they won't create those bad processes in the body, such as hardening of blood vessels, um, stress on the liver as well. Okay, so essential fatty acids are going to be like your omega-3 and your omega-6s. Now, omega-3, O-M-E-G-A, is the fatty acid that we're going to find in fish, um, flaxseed oil, um, walnuts are some examples, and those are good for fighting inflammation and fighting um, thrombosis as well. You know, I'm going to back back out and write some of this down for you. Okay. So essential fatty acids. I do want to talk about this briefly because this has kind of been a buzzword for a while in nutrition. We've got omega-3 and we've got omega-6. There's omega-9 as well, but these two are really going to be, there's all, all sorts of them. But the three that are really going to be essential in our diet, and what essential means is we've got to ingest them. Our body cannot make omega-3 and omega-6. Essential nutrients mean it's something that we have to ingest. 
So omega-3 is going to be fish. Um, walnuts, just to give you a few examples. Um, flaxseed. Okay. Omega-6s are found uh, potatoes, white bread, okay, corn. So a lot of the American diet is filled with omega-6s. And the omega um, usual American diet tends to be very lacking in omega-3. This is something that's become quite the buzzword lately because omega-3 is anti, um, yep, anti-inflammatory. anti-thrombotic. Sounds good, right? Anti-inflammatory means it keeps inflammation down. Anti, whoops, sorry, thrombotic means it fights off blood clots. Well, omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. Pro-thrombotic. Sounds bad, doesn't it? Here's the thing, there has to be a balance of both. In Alaska, where they tend to eat a lot of fish, because that's their primary source of protein, okay, they have a lot of omega-3. They have so much anti-inflammatory and anti-thrombotic that actually if they were to cut themselves, they could bleed. But I'm giving you an extreme example, okay? Give me an extreme example. So omega-3 is good in the right portions. We just happen to eat a lot of omega-6s. We have a lot of inflammation. We have a lot more of blood clotting, okay, um, than people, say in Alaska, do Japan, right, because they tend to have a, a strong fish diet as well. So omega-3 and omega-6 needs to be in a good balance. Omega-3 is a great supplement if you don't eat these types of foods to help calm down inflammation. Systemic inflammation is a cause of so many problems that we're finding. Okay, so it calms down that systemic inflammation, it calms down blood clots as well. You want to make sure, though, with omega-3 that somebody is not on, say, Coumadin, okay? You couple Coumadin with omega-3 at high doses and you could actually bleed out if they were to get cut or have any sort of internal injury, okay? So essential fatty acids, omega-3, omega-6 are going to be the major ones and these are the breakdowns of what they do, okay? Fats are important. I think we tend to think of fat as the enemy, okay? Fat is used for our sex hormones, adrenocortical hormones, cellular membranes, um, subcutaneous tissues to help to pre um, prevent heat loss. Also just comfort. People who are very, very skinny have a difficult time sitting because they don't have that layer of fat um, on their ischial tuberosities. Energy, it's a second source of energy, although it creates half the energy that glucose does. Okay, so fat is important in the right portions and the right types. So omega-3s is a good addition, polyunsaturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, um, PUFAs and MUFAs, people call them, is the nickname for them now. Those are found in like our olive oils, um, for example, okay, um, olives themselves as well. So there's good types of fat and there's bad types of fat. Dietary requirements should be 30% of the diet or less, 10% or less of saturated fat. If you have high cholesterol, it should be even lower, okay? Cholesterol less than 200 milligrams a day. Once again, that's a guideline. That's a guideline. Okay, proteins. So there's different types of proteins that you can ingest. Um, I'm going to zoom in on the screen again. Okay, different types of fat that you can ingest. There's animal sources, which is a complete protein. There are 20 amino acids. We've generally talked about amino acids, okay? And there's people that'll make you memorize all of them. I'm just gonna go over them in general, okay? There are nine essential amino acids. So once again, that means you need to ingest them, okay? There are 11 non-essential, which means your body can actually make them. Animal proteins has all 20. It's a, called a complete protein because it has essential and non-essential amino acids. It can give you all the amino acids you need in order to make the structures in your body, enzymes, um, hormones, etc. Now, vegetable protein. 
Vegetable protein is not a complete protein, but you can do combinations. One of the famous, famous combinations, excuse me, is rice and beans, okay? Rice and beans combined together have all 20 amino acids, okay? And all nine of those essential amino acids. Uses in the body is primarily building blocks, enzymes, okay? It, you really don't want to go into energy with malnutrition. If you're starting to tap into proteins, you're gonna start eating away at the tissues and the muscles of the body. Okay? That's where nitrogen balance comes in. Now nitrogen is one of the byproducts of the breakdown of proteins. Okay? If we were to actually look at the chemical makeup of an amino acid, it has nitrogen in there. So a positive nitrogen balance means you're ingesting enough amino acids to give you higher levels of nitrogen than stored in your body. Negative nitrogen balance means you're not getting enough proteins, you're starting to get lower levels of nitrogen, so you're not getting enough proteins to help support the tissues of the body, the tissues will start to break down, okay? We want to be in positive nitrogen balance. We want to be getting enough protein to support the structures of the body, so our body doesn't have to eat away at the tissues for energy, and also we can rebuild the tissues of the body, okay? Hormonal controls can accelerate protein synthesis. Great examples, growth hormone, also testosterone in males. Okay? Dietary requirements, about 10% of your diet. Vitamins are needed in small amounts for good health. They act as what are called coenzymes. They work with enzymes to facilitate processes in the body. I found in a variety of foods, great source for vitamins, of course, is going to be fruits and vegetables. Um, milk is going to be great. We've got calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and fortified milk. Okay. The major groupings are going to be fat soluble and water soluble. Water soluble are going to be bees. There's a whole bunch of bees. Okay. There's a whole bunch of bees. People group them together as what's called a bee complex. A and C. These are absorbed with water, except for B12. We talked about B12 needs that intrinsic factor from the stomach. If they don't have intrinsic factor, they have to have injections. These are not stored, excuse me. These will be absorbed, we'll use what we need, and then we excrete whatever we don't need, and your body will look for more to get more energy, okay? As opposed to the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K are ingested with fats, yet another reason we need fats in our diet. If we don't have fats in our diet, we can't absorb these four vitamins. These four vitamins are important for bone growth, eyesight, clotting, um, blood thinning. Okay, so I know I was saying clotting and blood thinning, K clots, E thins, okay. We need fats in order to absorb these. Okay, these are stored in the body, but here's the thing, because they're stored in the body, if you ingest a lot of them, they can keep getting built up and build up and build up and eventually cause side effects. One of the main things is you can actually cause damage to the liver, okay? So you don't want to go to high levels of these fat-soluble vitamins. When you talk about holistic things, both vitamins, herbs, minerals, you want to be careful to research what you're taking, to research the company from which you're taking the vitamins, to make sure that they're good quality, and they're within the normal daily values. You don't want to go above because it can actually cause damage, okay? A, C, E, you can add selenium onto there, are antioxidants. Antioxidants are substances, excuse me, that fight what are called free radicals in the body, okay? Free radicals will damage cells and they can increase the chance of cells becoming cancerous. A, C, E, and selenium will fight those free radicals and help to prevent cancer. So they're called antioxidants. Minerals, calcium and phosphorus, two examples. There are a ton of minerals, okay? Calcium helps to strengthen bones. Phosphorus is used for energy, ATP, okay? Help to make the body function. Iron's gonna aid the bonding of heme to hemoglobin. What that does is creates um, a good bond to carry oxygen out to the tissues of the body. Sodium chloride and potassium are our electrolytes. Calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium help to harden bones, okay? So here's just a few examples. I've tried to sort of pick out the most important ones. They're all important, but 
the major ones for um, the function of our body. Metabolism. Okay, this is a shout back from AMP1. Metabolism is the generalized term for biochemical reactions that either build up cells or break them down. That's basically all we're doing in our body. Build up cells, break them down. Build up cells, break them down. Okay? Anabolism is building cells up. Okay? Anabolic steroids are steroids that make muscles bigger. So anabolism is going to be forming larger molecules to build muscle, to build structure, or to store energy. So anabolism could also be the creation of glycogen from glucose. Okay, so it doesn't have to be the creation of bigger muscles. It could be the creation of any sort of molecule that will help the body to function better. Catabolism is when molecules are broken down. So if we turn, if we um, get bits and pieces of glucose off of glycogen, that would be catabolism. If we break down bones in order to rebuild new bone, that's catabolism. Okay, so anything that breaks substances down. Okay, cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the process to form ATP. Cellular respiration is the process to form ATP. In order to create ATP, we need glucose and oxygen. Okay, if we're going to create large amounts of ATP. We can also create it step by step through phosphorylation. We're going to go through this, okay? So cellular respiration, okay, is helping the creation of ATP. Oxidation reduction reactions, okay? This, is, this gets a little crazy. Oxidation reduction reactions is going to be the reactions, okay, this is how I want you to think of it. I really just want to go over this very, very briefly. Oxidation reduction reactions is going to be the movement of electrons, okay? The movement, write this down, the movement of electrons that helps to create energy. So this is going to be the step before the creation of ATP, okay? Well, it could be also the creation of ATP, but oxidation reduction reaction is going to be the movement of electrons that helps to create energy. Okay, so you could even cross off those, those paragraphs above. I really want to simplify this. Okay, the movement of electrons to create energy. Oxidation is loss. See that oil rig there? Oxidation is loss of electron. Reduction is gain of electron. Okay, so oxidation reduction reaction is going to be the movement of electrons to help to create energy. Oxidation is loss of an electron. Reduction is gain of an electron. Okay, I know this is confusing. I'm trying to take a really complex subject and make it really simple. Once again, like I said, there's only going to be five questions on your exam about this. So this movement of electrons creates energy. Okay, oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. So if we think about, let me get the screen back out again. If we think about ATP, and we're looking at this equation, okay, so oxidation is a loss of electron, reduction is gain. All that's saying in this equation, okay, is that this is reduced, oh, reduced. Okay, this is oxidized. Oh, I'm sorry, I got it confused. This is reduced. This is oxidized. The reason these are just confusing concepts, but the reason it's confusing is because the reduced is not reduced, it's gained an electron, hasn't it? So ATP is a reduced form, ADP is oxidized, okay? This is really all I'm going to go into about this because, once again, this is a very complex subject. Um, but what I want you to understand is reduced is when you gain an electron. Oxidized is when you lose it. This happens to create the transference of energy. That's as far as we're going to go with this, okay? So oxidation reduction reactions, these happen all the time in the body. They create energy in all sorts of the parts of the body. 
It's the movement of electrons to create energy. Okay, reduction is gain, oxidized is lost. Electrons, okay? Done, that's all we're gonna do with that. ATP synthesis, okay? ATP synthesis can happen in different ways. If you look at the next slide, the direct transfer of phosphate, so if we were to do ATP, ADP, add a phosphate, turn it into ATP, is going to be substrate level phosphorylation or direct phosphorylation. And you're just adding a phosphate and creating an ATP. This happens all the time in the body. But it only creates what? One ATP. Okay, so you're taking a phosphate, adding it to ADP, you're creating ATP. One um, ATP at a time. So it's not really um, efficient, is it? There's another step um, that we need to talk about. There's actually three steps in it. There's glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Okay? So glycolysis Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle is another name of it, and oxidative, oxidative, sorry, phosphorylation. Okay, oxidative phosphorylation. These three steps will happen in the cell, okay, to create tons of energy, okay? So bear with me. We're just going to go over the brief basics of it, okay, the brief basics of it. So let's actually move ahead a slide, okay? So we're at this little slide here where it says ATP. Oh, no. Hi, isn't he handsome? Okay, so that's not where I want to be. I want to be here, and then I want to be here, okay? That was one of the SUNY flyers, by the way. <laughs> if you're wondering what just happened. ATP synthesis. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. What you need to know is glycolysis, Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, also known as the electron transport chain. Okay? So under oxidative phosphorylation, put electron transport chain. I'll tell you exactly what you need to know. Glycolysis. You need to know what happens outside of the mitochondria. The mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. This is going to create a ton of ATP. Okay? So glycolysis, if glucose and oxygen are fed into glycolysis, glycolysis will lead to the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. The Krebs cycle will lead to oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. Okay. If you have glucose and oxygen, it will feed through these three steps to create approximately 36 ATP. Okay, keeping it super, super simple. Okay, so glycolysis happens outside the mitochondria. If we have glucose and oxygen, we could feed it into the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle will feed products into the electron transport chain. Okay, causing oxidative phosphorylation, creating 36 ATP. Done. That's as far as we're going to go with this. Because it's, it's, this could be a whole semester class on its own. I just want you to get the gist. And the main gist is the three steps. You need to know that you need glucose and oxygen feeding into the mitochondria to create this 36 ATP. You're going to hear different ATP in different areas. I'll explain to you why I use 36 in a little bit. Okay. And it creates a ton of ATP as opposed to adding one at a time, one at a time, okay? So that's it, that's all I want you to know, so don't panic, okay? So carbohydrate metabolism, whew, let's get back to simple stuff. Carbs are turned into glucose, okay? So we have these larger carbohydrates, they're broken down, they're turned into glucose, because once in a, again, we need glucose to feed into this whole cycle to create energy in the cell. Okay. Carbs are passed into the cells with facilitated diffusion with insulin. Okay. That's how they get into the cells. I don't know why I asked that question. Okay. So I could just you could just, just cross all this off. Okay. 
I want you to know the three steps, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. I want you to know glycolysis is outside of the mitochondria. Krebs cycle, electron transport chain are going to be inside of the mitochondria. If we have glucose and oxygen feeding into them, they're going to create 36 ATP. Done. Okay, so you can cross this whole thing off. Um, we're just not going to get that in depth into it. You can do that at micro. Okay. Glycogenesis, glycogenolysis. This is going to sound like a nightmare. It's very, very simple. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. It's the creation of the world. Okay, glycogenesis is the creation of glycogen. Lysis is the breakdown, the destruction of something. Glycogenolysis is the destruction of glycogen. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on the screen now. Glycogenolysis is um, the creation of glycogen either from glucose or fat. Okay. Glucose is stored in long chains in the liver and skeletal muscle. Glycogenolysis is the splitting of stored glycogen, the breaking down of glycogen to release glucose. Good. Gluco, which represents glucose, neo, which is new, genesis. This happens if you don't have enough glucose in your bloodstream. New glucose can actually be formed from glycerol, which is um, the backbone of fats. Okay, so glycerol is part of fats and amino acids. Excuse me. So you can actually convert fats and amino acids back to glucose, but it takes a lot of energy to do so. That process is called gluconeogenesis. It happens if we don't have enough glucose in the bloodstream. Lipid metabolism. Okay, um, four by nine by four. So every um, gram of carbohydrates that we ingest, it has four kilocalories per gram. Okay, four calories per gram. Every gram of fat we ingest has nine kilocalories per gram. Every gram of protein, I forgot where it was, has four kilocalories per gram. That's what that four by nine by four. So fats are gonna have more calories per gram is what I'm pointing out there, okay? Oxidation of glycerol, which is fat, okay, part of, part of fat, okay? That glycerol, which is part of fat, can enter the Krebs cycle. It can revert back to glucose, okay? But the thing is, it uses energy to create energy. So it only forms half the ATP from the Krebs cycle. This is why I use 18. If we pump in, some people say 38, some I've read even 34, because 36 is the number we're using for energy from glucose going into the Krebs cycle. 18 will be from fats. Lipogenesis and lipolysis. Once again, genesis is creation of stored forms of fat. We store fat as triglycerides. Okay, That means there's going to be a glycerol backbone with three... Um, fatty acid chains connected to it, triglyceride, okay? Triglycerides are how we store fats in our subcutaneous tissue. It, it occurs when glucose or, or glycerol levels are high, we have excess to deposit. Breakdown of triglycerides will break down into that glycerol and fatty acids, and it occurs when carbs are low, we'll tap into the fat, okay? That's the whole premise of Atkins. As you lower carbs, you tap into fat stores, you eat up your fat stores. Ketogenesis, when we don't have enough carbohydrates or we can't get those carbohydrates into cells, okay? So ketogenesis happens is when we don't have enough glucose in the body or we don't have insulin to get glucose into the cells. The body will next tap into fats to create energy, okay? So we're going to simplify this once again. Okay, simplify this, cross off the first two paragraphs. When we start to tap into those fats, the liver can only convert so much of that fat into energy. After the liver sort of burns out and it can't convert fat into energy, it'll start to create acids called ketones. That's where the process of ketogenesis happens. Okay? These ketones are acidic, they actually turn into acetone eventually and creates that, that fruity smell in people's breath, um, diabetics, when they go into ketogenesis. 
they'll get a fruity smell in their breath, okay? Now, it causes a metabolic acidosis. So their bloodstream starts to become acidic. So they start to hyperventilate. And if you think for a minute, you should know why. The respiratory mechanisms start to kick in to counterbalance metabolic acidosis. Carbon dioxide's acidic. Carbon dioxide is acidic. They hyperventilate to try to get rid of CO2. With getting rid of that CO2, we'll get rid of acidity. It'll calm down that metabolic acidosis. Okay, so ketogenesis causes what's called keto acidosis, keto, K-E-T-O, acidosis, A-C-I-D-O-S-I-S. -I -I the ketoacidosis is because the liver can only convert so much fat into energy, then it starts to turn into an acid called ketones. Those ketones are acidic, causes metabolic acidosis, can cause the creation of acetone, creating that fruity smelling breath people hyperventilate because they're trying to get rid of carbon dioxide to calm down the acidity in the body, okay? Complex subject. If you don't understand any of that, make sure you see me because this is clinical bread and butter stuff, okay? Protein metabolism. Proteins are gonna create our building blocks once again, okay? When we break down proteins, we'll actually break down into amino acids, okay? Um, the amino acids can break down further and release nitrogen. Okay, this is what the first paragraph is about. Nitrogen will be broken down into ammonia. Very bad for the body. The body will then convert ammonia into urea. Okay, so nitrogen from amino acids, when we break down these amino acids, nitrogen is turned into urea, urea, or I'm sorry, amino acid, I mean, uh, ammonia. Ugh, ammonia is converted into urea that has to happen because ammonia is very toxic for the body. Urea will be excreted by the urine, okay? So pretty simple. We'll take down those broken down amino acids and reform them into the proteins that we need for our body, okay? Oxidation of amino acids. Catabolic, anabolic state, organic molecules build up, broken down, we talked about that. Okay, amino acid carbs are fat pools. There's also free supplies of all these substances in the body. So of course, if you ingest a lot of fat, you can put it into your fat pool and store it for later. If you absorb a lot of carbs, you can do the same thing, amino acids, same thing. But if you run into a, de a deficit, you start to move into catabolism where you start to break structures down, okay? So it's a fine balance, isn't it? You don't wanna eat or ingest too many structures or you'll grow you know, and gain too much weight. You don't wanna ingest too little or your body will start to break structures down. Okay. Absorptive states, eating and digesting for about four hours, anabolism is bigger or better or more than catabolism. Glucose is going to be the major source of energy. It's regulated by insulin. We got that from the beta cells. Okay. Diabetes mellitus is when inadequate insulin is produced or insulin receptors are abnormal. There are two types. And I sure would like to talk to you about that. So if you're bored, take a break. Pause the tape, come back, because this is important clinical stuff. There are two major groupings of diabetes. Okay, this is what that last little phrase on your notes says, talking about diabetes could either be the lack of insulin or the ineffectiveness of receptors to insulin, two types. So there's insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Make sure I'm writing big enough. Insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, okay, IDDM. This happens when people generally are young. There's several theories as to what happens, but their islets of laying your hands cannot release insulin effectively anymore. Their islets of Langerhans cannot release insulin effectively anymore. So there's been some sort of autoimmune response, genetic response that's destroyed their islets of Langerhans. They now become insulin dependent. They need to take injections of insulin or have a pump, okay? So this tends to be young people. They have that acute onset of polydipsia polyphagia, polyuria, 
where they're ingesting food, they're ingesting fluids, they're urinating frequently, but they're very thin, okay? They have to get injections of insulin or they cannot survive, okay? Non-insulin, depend. whoops, that's an N, so non, ooh, sorry about that, non-insulin dependent diabetes, mellit um, diabetes mellitus is generally people who are older or people who are overweight. And what happens is their pancreas still releases insulin, but because they're heavier, the fat that circulates through their system actually makes the receptors for insulin ineffective on cells. Okay, so people with non-insulin diabetes mellitus have an ineffective receptor for insulin due to the weight gain. So obviously if they lose weight, guess what happens? They don't become diabetic anymore. Their body's able to use the receptors effectively. It's that um, fat that's in their system which makes the receptors ineffective. Okay. actually start to attack their receptors. So in, um, insulin dependent, non-insulin dependent, diabetes mellitus. Okay. post adorptive state, most of this you can sort of read on your own because this is stuff that we have talked about. Um, the only thing that I'm going to talk to you about is glucose sparing. Okay, so the brain will use glucose for the longest period of time. It will take glucose from the rest of the body so it can use it for the longest period of time, okay? Because the brain is so metabolic and needs glucose and oxygen so much. Um, and the brain is the most important thing really for the body. I mean, the whole body is important, but keeps everything else going, right? Okay, so glucose sparing is the brain will use glucose to the last minute um, over the rest of the structures of the body. The rest I'm gonna let you sort of read through on your own. It's all stuff on that post-absorptive state that we've talked about already. Metabolic role of the liver, it does it all does it all, it's unbelievable. Cholesterol metabolism, carb metabolism, fat, protein, stores vitamins and minerals, okay? Unbelievable, <laughs> liver's very important. Okay, cholesterol metabolism. So, um, the, the first little bit you could write, read through on your own, bile salts, vitamin D, steroid hormones, okay, are all, um, all require cholesterol. Um, comes from the diet, obviously. Your liver will also produce cholesterol. Some people's livers produce more cholesterol than others. So no matter what they eat, they still have high cholesterol levels. Kind of a negative thing. Insoluble in water. Now, what the liver does, this is the little section that I want to talk to you about, is it will take fats that we ingest and package it with proteins. So that way, the body can send those fats through the bloodstream, and the fat won't separate out in the bloodstream. Okay, so because once again, water, primarily what our plasma is made up of, and oils will separate if they are not emulsified. So the liver will take the fats that we ingest, associate it with protein, and then it will send it out to the body. Okay, those are called HDL, LDL, and VLDL. This is right in the notes, okay? HDL, LDL, VLDL. So HDL is high density lipo fat proteins, proteins. So we're bunching together proteins and fat. LDL, low density lipoproteins. I'm not gonna rewrite that, you can get that, okay? VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. Okay, also known as, this probably rings more of a bell, triglycerides. Just checking to make sure you can read that. Okay, also known as triglycerides. Okay, so the numbers are right in your notes. You want HDL to be 60 milligrams per um, 100 milliliters of blood or above. LDL is going to be 160 or below. Okay, the LDL, we don't really wrap that in there. Okay. But let me tell you the difference between these. High density lipoproteins. Now, protein is denser than fat. Protein is denser than fat. So a high density lipoprotein is gonna be mostly protein. This guy is gonna be more fat because it's a low density lipoprotein. 
Very low density lipoprotein is going to be pretty much all fat, you know, except for a little bit of protein. Not all fat, mostly fat. Okay, so HDL is like your happy lipoproteins. It's mostly protein. It'll go out into the tissues. It'll seek and destroy for excess fat, scoop it up, take it back to the liver to be excreted. Okay, so high density lipoprotein is our happy lipoprotein. It'll go out into the body, scoop up excess fat, and take it back to the liver to be excreted. Low density lipoprotein is going to be more fat. Low density lipoprotein will take fats out to the tissues, which is necessary, but only in a certain amount. So if our low density lipoprotein is very high, numerically speaking, it's taking excess fat out to the tissues depositing excess fat into the cardiovascular system, creating more inflammation in the body because fats are affiliated with inflammation. Okay, VLDL or triglycerides, bad, bad, bad. We want to keep those low. Okay, once again, we need a little bit to distribute fats out to the body, but we don't want to have a lot because then we can deposit excess fat into the tissues of the body and cardiovascular system. Okay, if you get excess fat into the cardiovascular system, it can put stress on the heart. It can clog arteries, okay? It can cause inflammation of those arteries and cause hardening of the arteries. So we wanna keep the fats at a low level. Chylomicrons we talked about, that's the last thing on this slide. Those are lipoproteins that our intestines will absorb and send through the lymphatic system right out to the body tissues, okay? It says from the small intestines to liver, that's not right. It goes from the small intestines to the, um, to the left subclavian. So not to the liver. Okay, chylomicrons go out to the body. Factors regulating plasma control levels. Okay, fat intake, obviously. This is the next slide. Saturated fat's bad. That's going to definitely increase your LDL and your VLDL. Unsaturated fat helps to remove cholesterol. So those PUFAs and MUFAs, um, olive oil is a great example, are really good at helping to clear those out. At certain levels, you don't want to eat a lot. Omega-3, we talked about that. Okay, helps to decrease inflammation, decrease clotting in the blood. Trans fatty acids, they've actually eliminated most of the trans fatty acids in food. Trans fatty acids are very bad. They spike LDL, they stress the liver. Um, so trans fatty acids, you definitely do not want to ingest those. But like I said, they're, they've tend to eliminated those. Um, I believe in New York City, they have to be eliminated 100% in restaurants. I could be wrong, but I think that I've read that. Okay, that's it for metabolism. Tons of information. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, once again, there's only five questions, very generalized metabolism questions on your next test, so don't stress if some of this is confusing. If it is confusing, you want to talk to me, absolutely send me an email or come see me at my office hours. Thanks a bunch. We'll talk to you guys soon. Have a good day.